Hello, Tucson. Hello. Ten years ago, I began a reluctant journey. Uh, ten years ago, I was tall and athletic. And one beautiful November evening, I was sitting in a car, and a stranger fired a gun. And the very last of those five random bullets hit me in the back. I think the cruelest part of that night was that I never lost consciousness. Uh, because I'd lost so much blood, my medical team couldn't risk sedating me. And so I was awake and alert when my trauma surgeon began my first surgery without anesthesia. I remember holding the chaplain's hand and begging him to tell my son how much I loved him. And mercifully, it did finally go black. And a few surgeries, a few pints of blood, a few days later, I woke up to find out that I had sustained a spinal cord injury. And I'm now paralyzed from the middle of my chest down. And I didn't know it then, and if I had, I wouldn't have been able to fully appreciate it. But it was in that instant that I became an inhabitant of this shadow space where because of my disability many people now see me as other not fully human I'm one of those people I spent the next several months in the hospital in rehab learning how to move my body safely learning how to protect my very fragile skin learning how to live without Something so simple as my body being able to automatically control my body temperature and how quickly with my spinal cord injury, something like that can become fatal. And during that same time, I had to learn how to move through space using a wheelchair. And I had to readjust my perspective. I was no longer six foot tall, looking out over the heads and shoulders of everyone else. I no longer had those easy eye-to-eye -eye communications with people. My perspective has shrunk, shrunk about two and a half feet. And now I look out at the world at butt level. <laughs> and the first year after my injury of discovery and exploration was pretty much about finding out who Jen was all over again inside this new body. And my biggest setbacks would come when the universe would decide to throw back the veil and reveal to me just what a jerk I'd been as an able-bodied woman. Somehow those always seemed to happen in that first year in public restrooms. <laughs> so early on, uh, right after I left the hospital, I still had on my full body brace. And uh, I wrestled that big door of the ladies' room open and I wheeled in past that first narrow stall and the next and the next all empty all the way down to the only one wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair. And I pulled on the door and it was occupied. So I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And the woman in there, I think she was turning it into a studio apartment. <laughs> I could feel her measuring for drapes while I waited. <laughs> And that was the first time that I really considered how many times I'd so callously exercised my own convenience. You know, waltzing into the ladies' room past all those skinny little stalls to that big coveted roomy one down at the end, right? So I could change my clothes or repack my suitcase or do yoga, whatever it was. <laughs> I'd never considered that in making those choices for my own convenience that I could be disenfranchising a person with a disability from their sole option for accommodation. And for a while, I'd wake up at night, you know, remembering times like the time I used illegally a uh, wheelchair accessible parking space, you know, because I was in a hurry 
and it was really important, and there were a lot of them, and they were always empty, and, and who could I possibly hurt? Or when I worked in retail and shrunk that 36 inch required access aisle just by a couple inches, because it was the holidays, we had a lot of merchandise to put out. And I would lay there at night and think, is this what karma is? And if it is, how much more do I have coming? <laughs> and it was that juxtaposition between this careless exercise of my able privilege without even thinking against this new reality of my disability and all those times that I was barred from access or opportunity by people doing exactly the same things that I had always done. Wow, did that sting. And as I moved through space, I found that I was never even considered. I didn't even bubble up into folks' consciousness. I was invisible, second class, just this creature in the shadow space. And as I uh, started experiencing public space more often, I learned that I made people uncomfortable. You know, they didn't know what to do with me. They didn't want to embarrass me, and they certainly didn't want to embarrass themselves, so it was easier just to pretend I wasn't there, that I was invisible. And I'm kind of an introvert, so I developed this public persona so I could confront the elephant in the room, the chick in the chair. And I learned how to joke about my disability, learned to, to joke about protecting your toes and being a monster truck. I developed this ready re repertoire of um, wheelchair quips and puns so that I could break the ice. If I could joke about my disability, then we could bridge this gap and I could be seen as human. And then we could communicate beyond these labels of ability and disability. And I began working in the civil rights area, getting out this message that disability rights are civil rights, that people with disabilities don't have special needs. I have exactly the same needs that you do. People with disabilities have all the same wishes and hopes, all the same drives and desires as anyone else. I might functionally access them differently. So, as we continued through this exercise, my friends became more aware. My friends became my able allies as they became better educated. They started calling me excitedly, Jen. I was out at the store and there was this guy in the parking lot and you know, he left his cart in the access aisle, but we had a great conversation about it and he's never gonna do it again. Or someone would call and say, I was at my favorite coffee shop, and now they're using that accessible restroom as a broom closet. We had a talk. They're going to move that stuff out of there because they recognize that everyone should have an opportunity to enjoy that space. And my friends learned to stop using pejoratives like confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound. They learned that language had power and they learned to use it appropriately. Because in my early days when I would go out, I would come home so psychically bruised because I didn't understand this language. It hurt, it felt icky, but I couldn't explain it. So much of the language that we commonly use around disability is so damaging, so victimizing. She suffers from paralysis. I thrive. I live with paralysis the same way you live with high blood pressure or you live with glasses. My friends now are willing to storm the state legislature to ask their elected officials, hey, why is it that people with disabilities represent a third of our population but have an unemployment rate of 60 to 80 percent, depending on whose numbers you're looking at. They're willing to take on the big challenges to create universal access for everyone.
And every time this happens, the circle grows. And my circle is so amazing with all of these people in it. I have a friend, Amina, who's very fond of saying that with 100% certainty, for some period of your life, you're going to end up with a disability if you're lucky enough to live that long. Our bodies change. So there are times that either through illness or injury, maybe pregnancy or age, that we're not able to accomplish things in the manner which we did before. And when we create inclusive space, then we create community for everyone without regard. Accessible space enriches us all. When I'm out watching a hockey game at a sports bar mm -hmm. and I'm watching the closed captioning, I'm taking advantage of technology that was created to uh, accommodate people who are deaf and hard of hearing. When you're schlepping your roller bag down a city street or pushing a stroller and you're able to use those curb cuts, that's an accommodation that was ostensibly created for people like me, people in wheelchairs, people with walkers, people in scooters. And recently I was in an airport and I was running late and I was so happy for the signage that had been mandated for people with visual disabilities. It was clear, it was easy to follow. But it enriches all of us because we're able to use it. So I have a challenge for you here today. When we leave, I challenge you to consider your space, to take a risk and do the uncomfortable, and look for those places where ableism creeps in and creates barriers. Sometimes they're, they're true physical barriers, like architecture. Sometimes they're barriers of attitudes, policies and procedures that bar people from full participation. And I challenge you to ask, why is that there? How can we fix it? How do we create community for everyone and give a seat at the table to every person? How do we recognize the humanness in every body and create truly inclusive space? Thank you.